I would like to welcome everyone to the first panel discussion. As I said, it's called The Future of Consumer Finance. As a reminder, please submit any questions you may have via the Teams chat. And I would like to introduce our esteemed panel moderator. This is Paulina Medina from University of Houston. And Paulina, please take it away. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raluca, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the conference, and in particular, thank you for joining us on this panel that has the very exciting task of talking about the future of consumer finance. My name is Paulina Medina. I'm an assistant professor of finance at the University of Houston. I work in the consumer finance space for 15 years with a special focus on how individual psychological traits influence financial decisions and the impact that this has on equilibrium outcomes. And I'm joined today by a group of top level panelists that will offer different perspectives on some of the most transformative developments in the consumer finance space over the last few years. Why don't we start with a round of introductions, but before we do that, let me know that the usual disclaimer applies. The views expressed during the panels are solely those of the panelists. They do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers, and no statement here should be treated as legal advice. Okay, so why don't we get started with a round of introductions. Uh, Ken, do you wanna, do you wanna go? Thank you, Polina. I'm Ken Benton. I'm my principal consumer regulation specialist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. I, I also edit our outreach publication for financial institutions, Consumer Compliance Outlook. Guilherme. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia to be here. I'm Guilherme. My name is Miguel Jose. I'm head of the division at the Financial Regulation Department in the Central Bank of Brazil. And my job is to study and propose regulation for consumer finance, uh, conduct and behavior, and as well as security measures as fraud prevention, cybersecurity, and other topics. Thank you. Thank you, Guilherme. Fredes? Hello, everyone. My name is Fredes Vindamontes. I'm Senior Financial Sector Specialist at the World Bank. I work globally on aspects related to financial infrastructure, including digital ID, credit reporting systems, open finance and open banking, open data, data protection, cybersecurity, and selected aspects of fintech. It's a pleasure being here with you today. Jane. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, Jane Barrett, I'm the Chief Advocacy Officer at MX, so bringing a practitioner view to the panel. Um, MX supports banks, credit unions, and fintechs with data and software to enable people to engage with their money. Um, and at the core of that is the ability to access and share data, clearly. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Financial Data Exchange, which is the industry group that has been driving open banking interoperability in the US. Um, prior to these, I was a fintech founder and founded a business that was based on people's transaction history, helping them to get started with investing. Uh, and I'm also an educator. I have about 14 courses on LinkedIn Learning around personal finance and have had close to a million people take my courses. So I get real-time feedback every day on uh, what people are thinking about their money. But uh, absolutely thrilled to be here and thanks for setting up. And thanks to Will for the great lead-in. Thank you, Jane. We're excited to have you. Uh, Jose Luis? Hi, uh, I, I can't see myself. I see you. I can. Help. We can see you and we can hear you. All right, perfect. Uh, well, my name is Jose Luis Negrin. I work for the Mexican Central Bank. I've been here the for over 25 years now, and I am now topics related to financial inclusion, uh, competition system, and also authorization of and team. There is an entry for the fintech. The central bank has to provide a positive. Uh, I will close out my comments there. Thank you, Jose Luis. And Karin? 
Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karine Temejian. I work in the European Central Bank, so in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, I work in the Market Innovation and Integration Division in our Director General Payments. And in our Market Innovation and Integration Division, we are basically uh, shaping the ECB's approach towards integration and innovation in payments as well as post-trade services. On my side, I focus on payments uh, and deal particularly with uh, different retail payments topics, uh, including including open banking. So, and very happy to be here today and share views. Thank you very much, Karin. So with this panel, um, why don't we get started? And um, we thought we would talk about one disruptive force in consumer finance uh, over the last several years. There has been this movement towards data sharing through open banking, open finance, and more generally just open data. So given the very diverse background of our panelists, both in terms of geographies, as well as in terms of the roles with regulators, as well as industry participants, we thought we can kick off this panel um, with just sharing some thoughts about the landscape of open banking, open finance, and open data um, from the different perspectives of our panelists. So, Fredes, why don't you give us an international overview of how you see things from your strategic position at the World Bank? Let us know if you can share your screen. There we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, first of all, um, I want to say that there is no um, definition of open finance or open banking uh, or no principles yet. So we look at the definition that the BIS has given on open finance. And uh, I would like also to mention that the previous panelist was also thinking on the same on the same ways that uh, that we have seen across the across the different jurisdictions that the sharing and leveraging of customer permission data by banks with third party developers in firms to build applications and services, including, for example, those that provide real-time payments, greater financial transparency options for account holders, marketing and cross-selling opportunities. Now, the World Bank also defines open banking as a system that allows customers to securely share information about themselves with trusted parties, and this is important. The main goal of open banking is to encourage competition, innovation, and that can lead to new products and services at lower prices and better terms and conditions for consumers. So based on that, uh, there are other aspects of open banking and open finance that we do not consider that as open banking, like uh, embedded finance and banking as a service. There are also data sharing environments, but that does not qualify for us as uh, open banking or open finance. Now, the two main uh, services that are uh, provided through open banking and open finance are payment initiation services and account information services. On payment initiation services, the main goal is to gather, gain some efficiency and uh, allow for consumers to directly transact through their account and make the payment through an initiation payment service provider instead of having to have an intermediary like a card network. This allows to reduce uh, the fees and the cost of the intermediation of the payment system services. In terms of account information services, we have seen that in many countries that uh, do call to have an open banking environment, the access to the accounts of the consumers done through web scrapping. And uh, that means that credentials are being uh, stored and captured without uh, most likely the knowledge of uh, the institution and the knowledge of the consumer. So this brings a, a lot of uh, uh, aspects related or concerns related to security and also to privacy. So through account information services, what is done is uh, the inclusion of an API uh, through uh, standards and the access to the data. It's uh, in an organized and a standardized manner with the consent of the consumer. Uh, through the account information services, uh, besides uh, uh, as, as opposed to payments, the objective is to for fintechs and other institutions to provide or offer additional services for consumers. As uh, uh, we have seen in, in previous panels, um, the objective is for those that do have an account 
and maybe do not have, uh, I mean, they have an, a basic account and do not have other services like credit or insurance or wealth management, that they could use that information to leverage and be used as a proxy to credit, the, uh, to credit history or to allow uh, insurance companies to offer them better terms and conditions. So that is uh, for the financial inclusion perspective. Now, the open banking and the open finance ecosystem is quite complex. As you see, it involves uh, individuals accounts and SMEs accounts. We have not seen open banking yet in the countries that we have looked at uh, uh, in for the corporate side, but we see that it's mostly on the retail side with, where it gets more benefits. Um, the main objectives of financial objectives that are driving the development of uh, open finance and open banking are innovation, financial inclusion, so matters of financial integrity and stability, like uh, uh, enhancing the onboarding process, aspects related to competition and consumer and data protection to get rid of the screen scrapping in competition. Uh, the objective is also to foster the inclusion of not only uh, additional services, but also additional uh, institutions that could provide additional services such as fintech uh, institutions. Now we see also that there are infrastructures that are super relevant and platforms that are relevant for open finance uh, frameworks like authentication and consent and redress mechanisms and also enablers that are already in the in the financial sector like payment systems. Fast payments is a critical enabler for payment initiation services, but also trade information systems, digital IDs and companies registries also help enhancing the development of open finance and open banking. Now, what does it mean? Like there are many types of uh, uh, accounts, basic accounts, uh, credit accounts, checking accounts, savings, credit, wealth, mortgage and insurance. And as we see across the jurisdictions, not all of them develop the open finance or the open framework, uh, banking uh, framework in the same manner. Some of them do a phased approach. Some of them focus only on banking or only on payments uh, accounts. And some of them move all the way to all different types of uh, all different types of uh, uh, accounts. Now, these are information that comes from incumbents, but then you can add new providers that are the ones that are accessing data. And also, you have brokers in between that use the data to provide data analytics. What type of data is it provided in the in through the open finance? So we have two types of data: market data, which relates to maps, locations, access points, commissions which is considered like non-confidential data and does not require the consent of the consumer. And then we can have a transaction data from payments, deposit savings, credit accounts, and investment insurance that requires the consent of the consumer. And it could go into different layers. It could go into just the balance of the account or all the history of the account. This is done through the uh, standards that are uh, for the APIs on security messaging and data. So the data directors are super important to define what is the data that is going to be shared and also the scope of the services. Some countries we have seen that they only develop uh, payment initiation services and others that move all the way to payment initiation services and account information services, while others stay only on or start only on account information services. Now, the operational rules and the uh, aspects that relate to the accountability, to access, pricing, and so forth, are typically developed through a governance mechanism. And uh, we have seen also that this is not uh, uh, also homogeneous across the different jurisdictions. And there are different uh, ways of tackling the uh, governance approach. So it could be through a centralized approach. It could be like a, a central bank or financial sector authority led, or it could be the industry that based on the regulation that are set up to uh, develop or open the APIs, they come together and they create the standards based on the uh, institutions and also independent entities that come in and provide all these, develop all these standards for their members. So um, I'm just showing you here the methods to access data in entities in, in jurisdictions that there has not been a uh, holistic approach to develop a framework on open finance or open banking, the access to the data is done through web scrapping or reverse engineering, and uh, very unlikely to be done through APIs unless there is a bilateral agreement between a, a banking institution 
and uh, the fintech companies or the third party providers that is accessing the data. Otherwise, the, the other methods more common are web scrapping and reverse engineering. This is one thing that we have seen across very commonly across all the jurisdictions, the transition to the APIs as a standard to access data due to the security that it provides and the trust on consumers. And this, uh, I think that some of the panels will show the case of uh, uh, the US that has started with web scrapping and moving transitioning to uh, APIs uh, according to the rule 1033 from the CFPB. And in terms of the participants, we have the data holders. These data holders, depending on the on the scope of the open banking and the open finance, could be only regulated entities, could be only a fraction of them, like in the UK, only the nine largest banks started that. Or uh, it could be a progressive approach, like in Brazil, that they started with uh, some institutions and then progressively adding other institutions. Or it could be a, uh, a set of institutions across the different uh, uh, service providers and the different sectors, like in the case of India, where you have banks, non-bank financial institutions, but you also have insurance companies and brokers, and even the tax authority that is part of the tax uh, data holders in the, in the ecosystem. Then uh, you have other participants like financial sector authorities, data protection authorities, and maybe competition authorities in some cases, uh, notably the case of the UK and uh, the case of, the, of Australia, where they act as catalysts of digital financial services, but they also hold an oversight role of financial infrastructure. In some cases, they are also operators of uh, some financial infrastructure, notably in the case of uh, payment systems and uh, fast payments. And uh, they also um, act as supervisors of uh, and regulators of uh, the participants, both account holders and in some cases also the uh, data recipients. And then you have the third party providers, which could be offering payment initiation services or account information services. And in between, you have the API developers, the technology platforms developers that provide some kind of uh, services that are necessary to implement the, uh, the open finance framework, which could be registration of trusted uh, third party providers, it could be managed or consent management. Uh, hi, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there are a lot of echoing from um, multiple people. Uh, I would like to um, tell everyone to please uh, mute yourself if you're not talking, other than the speaker. Thank you very much for understanding. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, and uh, um, thank will, uh, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was here in the same. Uh, so this uh, this infrastructure could be a cent could be based on a centralized approach, or it could be based on a decentralized approach. And we've seen that the centralized approach is, is very common in countries where the uh, payment systems uh, initiation services are developed, uh, as opposed to the account information services, where they tend to be more atomized and more decentralized. Even in the case of India with the account aggregator, there is not only one account aggregator, but 14 of them that are operating in the environment. So um, just to show you a flavor of the more than 80 countries that have been developing or are in the process of developing open finance frameworks and across from all the way from Latin America to uh, Asia, all of this have been developing different forms and different flavors. So um, just, just to mention, for instance, that in the European Union, that has been a leader in the, in the development of uh, the open banking and now is transitioning into open finance. The key component was the implementation of the PSD2 framework that was proposed in 2013 and moved and implemented uh, in 2018. And uh, it uh, allows the authorized third parties to access account information to initiate uh, payments with customer consent. And the account information services that were provided were related to the payment initiation services to understand if there are funds available in the account so that the uh, payment initiation service could, could take place. Now, moving into open finance, additional services will be developed. In the case of, uh, of the UK, it was uh, moved by uh, a competition element and the, uh, there was a, a strong need to move forward the competition in the retail segment. And that's why nine banks were forced to open their data, and then uh, there was a need to establish a governance agency, it's called OBI, to develop uh, all the standards on how these uh, nine uh, largest banks will share the data with third party providers. This also has evolved and is evolving into open finance and the development of additional services. In the, UN in the US, 
We are not yet calling that this uh, open finance, uh, and this might be a little bit controversial, but we see that it's a market-led uh, approach where there is no uh, standardized uh, the standardized uh, approach to the APIs, to the, to the regulation, to the development of, uh, of the third-party providers, a registration, a trusted framework, but uh, more or less the, the banks have uh, come into agreements with different fintechs and service providers, and certainly there are some players in the market that have been benefiting from being the, the first mover. Now we'll see what happens with uh, the new rule that the CFPB has proposed in the section 1033 and uh, moving on to the uh, accessing data through, through APIs in a more standardized manner. If we look at the uh, lag in the Latin America and the Caribbean region, we see different forms and uh, frameworks from Mexico and Chile stemming from the implementation of the uh, FinTech law. Uh, and uh, others like uh, Colombia that uh, started with the implementation of open banking for the development of payment systems, but uh, also broadening the scope in a parallel trail to develop open data in the financial sector, which goes beyond financial services and also included information, for instance, uh, from tax authorities and from other authorities that could be relevant for the uh, accessing financial service, in particular credit for SMEs, but also uh, at the same time they are developing open finance. So it's a complex environment and uh, different uh, different uh, route that uh, Mexico and Chile are following. Uh, moving on to Asia, we see very interesting cases in the case of Australia move directly to the uh, open uh, data, the implementation of the consumer data right, but at the same time there is a sectorial approach so the Treasury is leading the open uh, finance and open banking in the case of um, uh, the open banking and open finance for the financial sector. There is also the case of Singapore, which also was a collaboration between the financial sector authority and the institutions where uh, there's uh, not a standardized approach to the regulation, to the uh, development of the trusted framework, but the uh, APIs were published and there is a playbook that is available for those that want to consume those uh, those APIs. Uh, in the case of uh, India, as we have seen, the India um, banks a lot on the India stack, which is what is called the, the, the India stack, that is the development of different layers of infrastructure from ID to payments and uh, later on to data. Uh, the payments uh, rail goes in a in a different uh, rail than the open banking, and I would not call it an open banking environment. But uh, the account aggregator, it's uh, certainly an open finance environment that is very particular and very unique because you have a figure of uh, account aggregators which act solely as consent managers, but they do not access the data and they do not provide any data analytic services, but just put into common the uh, data holders with the data users. And certainly the data holders are from all the different sectors and the data users are also from all the sectors. The only uh, constraint is that they need to be regulated entities by either the Reserve Bank of India, the pension uh, regulator, the insurance regulator, or the capital markets uh, regulator. So that uh, uh, limits the participation of uh, fintech companies unless they are regulated by each of these uh, regulatory authorities. Thank now, you, thank uh, you very much, Fred. I'll stop here. <laughs> no, thank you very much for this thorough overview. I think it's super important to have all these different definitions and get uh, this kind of like big picture of how different the landscapes are, which I think it really builds on what Will was saying earlier, that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the policies that have been put in place to foster this data sharing and innovation. In that sense, we're very fortunate because we have here in the panel representatives of many of the key players in, in the world, right? Um, for example, the case of Brazil that has been such an important player, both because of their market size, but as well um, because they moved early on and they have had a lot of activity for some time. So, Guilherme, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the landscape in Brazil? Yes, thank you, Paulina. So, uh, I'm going to be very quickly in my presentation to, to bring an overview of the open finance implementation and the key facts from Brazil. Uh, so, just just to start, the, the Central Bank of Brazil is working under six 
uh, pillars, which is inclusion, competi competitiveness, transparency, education, sustainability, and excellence. And regarding the technological innovation agenda, we have four fundamental blocks. Uh, the first one is PIX, which is our fast payment system in Brazil. Uh, the second one is the currency internationalization, the open finance, which I'm going to do deep dive uh, in my presentation today, and the DREX, which is our CBDC under construction uh, related to the tokenization of the economy. And uh, what are the key regulatory rules for open finance uh, that I, I can bring and share to you? Uh, the first one is the mandatory participation of the biggest financial institution. So that is key. It's a regulatory driven uh, regulation. Uh, but uh, although we have the biggest ones, uh, we have a lot of voluntary institutions participating. The second one is a mix of regulation and self-regulation from the market. So we have uh, uh, the main drivers are putting re regulation from the Central Bank of Brazil, but the markets can work and, and the technical and op operational aspects under a governance where a lot of financial institutions and payment institutions, they are representative in the governance of the market self-regulation. Uh, the, thir the third pillar is the, that data sharing and payment initiation requires previous consumer consent for a specific purpose. And this is something that is backed uh, by our uh, general data protection law uh, as well. We have safe, agile, and standardized APIs and UX journey on another operational process. So everything is standardized to, to this work. I, I miss Guilherme, can everyone hear? Yeah, Guilherme is on mute. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Okay, so uh, let's move on. <laughs> so, and uh, we'll open finance in 2022. So uh, what are our scope? Uh, we, we, we op the Open Finance in Brazil is not only data, we are talking about payment initiation. So regarding data, we have a huge scope. So that includes accounts, credit cards, credit operations, investments, uh, foreign exchange, acquiring insurance and pension funds. So, uh, and, and regarding payment initiations, all, all is, is centralized with PIX. So we have the immediate peaks, pre-scheduled peaks, intelligent transfer and recurring pre-scheduled peaks. And uh, also we are coming soon, we are introducing the portability service, which I'm going to talk about. Just to present some big numbers from Brazil, we, we are almost uh, with 30 million active consents given by unique individuals, which represent almost 20% of the Brazilian adults here. Uh, we have more than 1.4 billion weekly API calls for data sharing, and we have more than 900 participating institutions. So that represents one of the largest open finance ecosystem in the world uh, in terms of scope, users, and API calls. And uh, Open Finance, as I said, is integrated with PIX, our fast payment scheme. And PIX, it's a huge case of success here in Brazil. Uh, we have, uh, since its beginning to 2020, we had more than 140 million and more uh, people, uh, users using PIX. And that brought a lot of financial inclusion with uh, clients in the uh, with in the banking system and the payment systems using Pix, and so they are all included in our financial ecosystem in Brazil. And uh, uh, talking about uh, the, the improvements of the open finance, uh, the future is now. 
we we can already see a lot of benefit beneficials to the users as an easier users onboarding to opening accounts or uh, hiring credit financial aggregation management tools financial education tools a more efficient credit analysis models a credit portability and simplifying payment journeys and e-commerce and programmable payments so just to bring some uh, quantitative examples of these benefits uh, some of the examples of open finance uh, includes some financial institutions could raise the consumer credit limit on credit cards for example uh, and after analyzing the data for the open finance so the the, the customer could save uh, almost 1.5 million dollars uh, from paying overdraft interest rates uh, with open finance with advice that the, the customer could uh, bring more money to account and other other things and uh, and for example a, redu a reduction in the the process of opening an account in just uh, two hours and even less for that and uh, more is coming uh, as credit portability wages and investment so uh, we we have a, a lot of uh, huge success here in the open finance in Brazil and that I'm I'm pleased to, to talk more about later. Thank you. Thank you, Guilherme, and thank you for touching on all the relevant points you're telling us a little bit about the participation of industry players that I'm sure has a lot of um, network externalities and can encourage uh, competition of other players as well. And you touch on the consumer protection issues and you talk on the payments issues. So really you are giving us a good overview on things that we're gonna dig in uh, later on. And as Fredes did as well, she did mention how different countries have these different approaches. And she mentioned the case of Mexico. Um, when it comes to Mexico, um, Mexico has had a, a unique approach towards this open banking regulation because it started looking at the fintech activity. Uh, Jose Luis, can you tell us a little bit about how Mexico has dealt with this? Uh, yes, Paulina, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here at this uh, Philip Head seminar. It's always a great discussion with you. Uh, well, what was happening? is that uh, the the fintech law uh, is the uh, that was issued in 2018 uh, is the one that introduced the open banking possibility for for the Mexican firms um, and this is happening in a moment where uh, the digitization digitization process is happening everywhere in the world but in particular in Mexico so before the law the fintech law was issued there was really no solid legal background for some services based on technology to be provided. And so the fintech law filled up that uh, vacuum. But at the same time, the fintech uh, movement was seen as an opportunity to solve several policy goals, in particular, a little bit like what Guillaume was saying, uh, the, the, to try to improve on financial inclusion and promote competition in the supply of financial services. Those were explicit goals of the fintech law. Um, and let me give you an idea, even though we have made a lot of progress in the financial inclusion front in Mexico, there is still a very important lack of inclusion affecting both individuals and firms, in particular small firms. So in Mexico, like half of the population today has a deposit account um, in a formal institution, but only a decade ago, only one third of people had a, a deposit account in a formal institution. The same thing with firms holding a deposit account. It grew from 24% in 2014 to 51 in 2020. And with loans, same thing. You know, only one third of the adult population has access to a loan. And at the same time, with firms, lots of small and medium sized firms uh, to go to family and friends to get. Uh, funds because they don't get any funding from from formal institutions. So not only that, but the pro another additional problem for financial inclusion is that even those people that are included, they tend to use only partially their their financial services. They tend to, uh, for example, if you have a deposit account, 
they use it to get money just from the ATMs, but they don't use it uh, to pay. They didn't use it to pay. That thing has been changing, and now it's more pop it's more common to pay with uh, debit cards than even with credit cards. Mexico is a very uh, sort of polarized society. You have a very big gap in terms of inclusion. There is a very important group that doesn't have access, as I just mentioned, some some, Norvises, some numbers. Um, and the financial system in Mexico is dominated by banks. You know, it's uh, concentrated, it's really high. And so uh, one of the things that the fintech law was trying to achieve was to reduce this concentration and was trying to reach other uh, other providers. So since the fintech law was issued, um, there's been over 81 institutions that applied for a license to enter as a fintech. and um, you know, many of them are already operating. Many of them offer uh, digital payment services. At the same time, you have a lot of financial uh, institutions that were not banks that are turning into banks, and they are all offering digital services. So um, for all these uh, institutions to really be become relevant, um, Open banking offers a great opportunity. Um, in maybe it's different than in other countries where the type of services may be more like, a, you know, moving from one bank to another or concentrating all your information, all your personal information uh, in a manager, in a, in a tool that manages all your information. Here in Mexico, it has a bigger, I think it has, I mean, additional to that, a bigger potential in, uh, in impact on uh, financial inclusion. No, so I have to say that we still have to take several steps on the on the open banking to actually become a reality. Because even though we have it in the law, secondary regulation still needs some uh, elements to be to be issued. Uh, I I could I would close my comment, Paulina. Thank you. Thank you, José Luis. And yeah, I think it is actually a very unique approach, the one that Mexico has taken, that instead of starting with the data sharing process, uh, starting kind of like more with the consumer end of, of this chain, you know, looking at the fintech regulation and how the fintech regulation will need some data sharing to be powered. So, um, and this impact on financial inclusion is certainly something that we will elaborate on later on in the panel. And well, as Fred has mentioned, right, the European Union also has had a, a key role in shaping uh, regulation. So, uh, Karin, do you want to tell us a little bit about the experience, the European experience? Yes, sure. Thank you. So here, indeed, I will focus on what is the regulatory part of uh, of uh, this topic, while there is also a more catalyst part uh, of uh, of this discussion in Europe. But say, looking now at uh, the the regulatory experience, first of all, I mean, let me say that open banking in Europe can really be considered as one of the key disruptive developments in recent years that would impact uh, fundamentally retail payments. And as a central bank, the ECB has a strong interest in efficient and integrated financial markets and infrastructure, which the ECB aims to facilitate. And in that respect, we see um, a lot of opportunities in open banking and actually also potentially open finance, even if this is beyond uh, our remit, as these models would, uh, in principle, allow the emergence of completely new products. And the basis for this, and this is what is actually the disruptive part, is that data, otherwise that the data that would be kept in a bilateral relationship, is now made available to companies, so fintechs, that have expertise in de developing new tailor-made and customer-friendly products. And therefore, open banking enables new payment solutions that would otherwise not come to existence potentially as single PSPs or banks would not easily develop these. So in the European Union, uh, there is a legislative basis for open banking that was introduced with the second payment services directive, as the colleague from the World Bank mentioned, uh, that became effective then in 2018. So the PSD2, in short, um, as its name indicates, is affecting only payment accounts. So this is the payment account data. And part of the, the PSD2 open banking model is that the bank, the bank's customers is giving its permission to share its own data with the third party provider. And this can be account data, 
a list of accounts or transaction details, for example. And the data is shared, uh, as was mentioned before, through interfaces, typically API, so automated programming interfaces. The PSD2 has introduced two types of open banking services, as was mentioned before, payment initiation and account information services. And there, accordingly, there are two types of service providers that were introduced, so namely the payment information services providers and account information services provider. So a fintech that wants to offer advanced payment services to its customers must be given access to the bank's customer payment account so that it can then initiate a payment. So PSD2, as uh, the legislative basis, was a main driver for open banking. And following the PSD2, uh, many fintechs have applied to get this new PSP license and start providing either payment initiation and or account information services. Well, the experience, however, has shown that this did not play out uh, as smoothly as one would have hoped for. And there are different reasons for this. One of them is that the basic account information had to be provided for free to the third party providers, which in itself is not providing a lot of incentives to provide well-functioning or high quality APIs. And uh, there were also minimal requirements for the implementation of uh, PSD2 open banking. So this overall contributed to a rather low take up of open banking services. And uh, it looked like the newly introduced uh, payment services was not working too efficiently uh, and not across Europe as well. So uh, now the European legislator has uh, reacted to this shortcoming and has issued a proposal for a revised legislation, actually more or less one year day for day. This was on 28th of June last year, uh, that takes on board these lessons learned from the experience with the PSD2. And uh, notably, the new proposal contains revised rules for payment services that are part of open banking to make uh, essentially life easier for third party providers and therefore foster competition. Um, and the new rules also foresee, for example, requirements uh, for high quality interfaces so that the third party providers have easier access to payments data and also um, ensure that uh, certain obstacles that third party providers were facing are prohibited. So as I said, this is the regulatory part. There is also a catalyst part to this story in Europe, but I will come to that later. Thank you very much, Karin, and we are also looking forward to hearing about this catalyst part that we'll discuss shortly. Um, so we've been fortunate so far to hear from the regulators themselves um, how the landscape has developed in some countries where the regulators have had a lot of activity since early on. In some other places, like the U.S., uh, the story is a bit different, no? And in the U.S., um, industry participants have the ones that have moved that moved early on, and them, they themselves develop the infrastructure for financial and non-financial institutions to access data from financial institutions. Um, so I would like to hear from Jane, and uh, maybe Jane, you can tell us a little bit about how you see the landscape for data sharing in the US from the perspective of a key industry participant that is ultimately powering a lot of the fintech services that we see out there. Great, thank you so much, Paulina. Um, I think the most important thing to set the baseline for the US is just the complexity of the ecosystem here. Even though it's one country, you have federal and many state level uh, regulators and policymakers providing, again, a lot of complexity, but it's also the sheer size. Like we have over 10,000 covered financial institutions all the way from the multi-trillionaires down to a church basement credit union. Uh, we also have over 10,000 uh, fintechs. So this many-to-many -many ecosystem of data sharing is enormously complex. Um, having said that, from an industry-led perspective, I think uh, there has been enormous progress made um, before God drank 1033 is going to be implemented, which I'm going to leave it to Ken to talk about the key dimensions of, of that. But what I would like to, to approach from the ecosystem perspective is almost through four views. There is the late regulatory view. There is the technology view, just how the tech has moved. There's a customer and the customer experience view. And then there's a competitive view. So I think from the, uh, from the regulatory side, again, Ken will dive in deeper, but I think it is important to note that there is enormous agreement in the ecosystem 
around the coming, like the intent of the coming regulation. Again, it is a 300 page draft rule and that there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of very good elements of it. There's some problematic ones, but from the regulatory side, I think the intent is, is, is there is a lot of alignment. Um, I think one of the core challenges is that it is so narrow in scope. Right, it's really just retail only. So checking, well, current accounts, checking accounts, credit cards, um, and digital wallets is far narrower than what the industry has actually achieved already. And so I think that leads into the second view, which is um, from the technology perspective, the financial data exchange has been around since 2017. It is a uh, an industry consortium of both fintechs and financial institutions, as well as consumer advocates. And the core intent of FDX is to stand up an interoperable standard, right? So what is the API spec that will enable data to be shared? Um, right now, well, as of the last release, which we shared in, in March this year, there was 76 million consumers using APIs um, or FDX compliant API data sharing. So I think for, at that point it was more than most of the other uh, most of the other markets combined from a much broader view. So there has been at at scale um, a lot of adoption. The challenge with that scale is that it is concentrated amongst most of the trillionaires. So it follows the TAM of the marketplace, which is, you know, the biggest banks. I mean, there we're seeing like smaller credit unions stand up APIs. There is a lot more adoption now, but the the um, the FDX spec has actually been very successful to set not just that regulatory, what we have to do from a retail perspective, but a much, much broader way to interoperably share data. So everything from loan data, investment data, tax documents, statements, all of these things are already baked into the spec. It is a voluntary spec, which means that, you know, um, companies can pick and choose. And I say companies because it's not just monodirectional bank to fintech. There is a lot of bank to bank. There is also fintech data sharing happening through the APIs. Um, so I think there has been a lot of progress from that technology perspective. I think the third lens of the customer experience is where things start to get really interesting in the US ecosystem. Um, if you think of a very blunt analogy, when people, I don't know, I remember dial-up Wi-Fi, like dial-up internet, and it took forever and, you know, you had to spend a few minutes connecting versus high-speed Wi-Fi. You walk in, it automatically connects. And that that really is the analogy to screen scraping, which again, the industry agrees needs to go away to these open banking APIs. And we're seeing, um, you know, people very much get used to not just, okay, I'm going to connect once and it felt good. There is, it normalizes the use of these APIs. Um, and we see it as at MX is that when you offer higher level of insights, right? So we have an insights product that shows based on your data, what's an SBS action. Um, we see the average of com accounts connected go from two to three to five to seven. So people get it. They're like, oh, I can bring my data in and I can see, you know, much more of my 360 degree view of, uh, of my um, of my money. So, you know, we are starting to normalize tokenization. We're starting to normalize controls, you know, people within their bank app turning on and off controls. So customer experience actually is a huge part of the ecosystem and, and there has been widespread adoption. But that does lead to, I think, frankly, the most interesting part of open banking in the US is the competitive lens, which, you know, right now we have a push and pull situation. So you have very large banks pushing for these very advanced usage of, um, of open banking. So things like tokenized account numbers, um, which is problematic with our current ecosystem because things like FedNow does not work with the tokenized account numbers. Um, things like pay by bank, which we saw in the UK, actually pay by bank adoption was very um, fast and frankly faster. I think there is a sense that the US is so committed to rewards points, but you know, again, we're seeing large banks investing deeply in pay by bank through open banking channels. So there's a lot of pushing on sort of the more advanced um, competitive advantage of 
of open banking technology. And then you have the pull where we're trying to pull the rest of the ecosystem along, so smaller institutions. And frankly, if you have four years to comply with a very narrow view of open banking, you are so far behind what the rest of the ecosystem is doing. And so that's a concern. You know, we have 2,000 financial institutions as customers for us. And we've been saying this for many years. It's like you need to do this more from a competitive advantage perspective versus the regulatory stick. And I think that's, you know, that's where the U.S. is right now is how, to, how can we move everyone along faster. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. And yeah, I mean, lots of things to highlight from your input. One that strikes me is that how you started talking about the complexity, no? And I guess being hosted by the Philly Fed in the US, we think that's the normal situation, no? With 10,000 industry participants and so on. But up until, Jose Luis will know this better, but until, up until a few years ago in Mexico, there were 45 banks, 45 versus the thousands that we see in other places. And obviously that has changed as well in Mexico with the regulations that Jose Luis mentioned. Um, but before going into that, um, why don't we hear from Ken the perspective from the regulator um, on how things are changing in the US as, as some of you have mentioned, yeah, the CFPB has been actively working on this topic and just during the month of June, there were some important developments, Ken. Thank you, Polina. So can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. So today I'm going to discuss um, section, the proposal from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to implement uh, section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act. So the Dodd-Frank Act was enacted in response to the financial crisis in 2008, uh, designed to strengthen the financial regulatory framework to prevent a repeat of, of that crisis, but it also included in Section 1033, looking forward, uh, a requirement that the CFPB issue a rulemaking proposal, I'm, I'm sorry, rulemaking rule to uh, facilitate open banking in the United States. Um, this has been as discussed during this conference. Other countries have widely adopted open banking. Uh, its goal is to increase competition, reduce costs, expand financial inclusion, and foster innovation. Um, the Bureau's rule, which was issued in uh, October of last year, uh, is an important milestone in adopting uh, open banking in the U.S. So the proposal's features include, and this is probably the heart of it, a requirement that data providers, as defined in the proposal, allow consumers and their authorized third parties access to certain uh, of their data from that institution. Um, the proposal clarifies that the Electronic Fund Transfer Act, the, the federal law that protects consumers uh, against fraud and errors in their electronic transfers, applies to uh, open banking. It restricts the sale, marketing, and use of this data. Uh, we heard a lot in the conference about data scraping. The proposal specifically prohibits the use of that. And most importantly, I think, is security protocols. The industry and, and everyone is very concerned um, if third parties and, and consumers can access their financial data, which might contain sensitive information that can facilitate fraud, there has to be very tight guardrails and security protocols uh, to prevent that fraud or at least mitigate the risk of it. So the proposal breaks down into three main actors, the covered data providers. So that is the financial institution or other party that has the consumer's data. Um, the CFPB did not uh, limited this in this first phase of this proposal to financial institutions with consumer deposit accounts that are covered by Regulation E, uh, credit card issuers, digital wallet providers such as PayPal and these so-called neobanks that are non-depository institutions that have financial accounts such as Chime. And the Bureau indicated that it may expand this definition in the future, for example, to mortgage lenders and debt collectors. Um, an authorized third party. So the consumer can um, authorize someone else to access their data. And 
um, the person who is authorized may retain a data aggregator to actually retain that data. And I think it's helpful to provide an example to see how that would actually work in the real world. So I apply for a mortgage loan and the lender, as part of its underwriting, wants to examine my financial transaction uh, data in my bank account because there are now these fintech algorithms that can help make credit decisions based on that data. So I authorize my lender to access my account. So the lender is an authorized third party. I've given them permission to access my checking account with my bank. And the lender doesn't want to do the the, the details of actually re retrieving that data. So it retains a data aggregator, a company that specializes in obtaining this data from my financial institution. And it actually receives the data, gives it to my lender, and my lender uses it in its credit decision. So that that's really the nut of it that um, will have consumers or their authorized parties requesting data from their covered data providers as shown on the slide and, and obtain that data in a standardized format. So what data are we talking about? I mean that, you know, the devil's always in the details and the covered data that must be provided is account balances in the covered account, uh, a minimum of 24 months of transaction information, the terms and conditions of the account, information to facilitate payments such as routing number and account number and an upcoming bill information. The proposal also indicates that in the future, the definition of covered data may be expanded uh, to include additional data. So what are the effective dates? And I, I want to emphasize this is a rulemaking proposal. Uh, federal law, the Administrative Procedure Act, requires that the Bureau first issue a proposal, solicit comment from stakeholders and the public, and then come back and issue a final rule uh, after considering the feedback from the during the proposal. So the Bureau indicated that after it issues a final rule, it anticipates that the effective dates are shown in this slide here will depend on the size of the institution and whether it is an insured depository institution or a non-depository institution. So if you are a very large depository institution like Chase or Citi or Wells with more than 500 billion in assets, you would have an implementation date of six months. If you're between 50 and 500 billion depository institution, 12 months, um, et cetera, as shown on the slide. And um, <clears throat> non-depository institutions um, have different thresholds and timing. So the Bureau also indicates that it expects that the proposal will, uh, that it will be issuing a final rule later in this year, uh, after which these deadlines, if they are continued in the final rule, will become effective. So we've talked about what providers have to disclose. The Bureau also clarified what they do not have to disclose, data used to combat fraud, uh, data that provider cannot retrieve in the ordinary course of business, data that might be protected by other laws, such as gram leach bliley privacy law, and confidential commercial information, uh, such as algorithms used to determine credit scores. So how must providers transmit data? And, and the devil is always in the detail. And we heard talk about the APIs, the application program, programming interfaces. The proposal has a discussion of what the APIs, what the requirements that the APAs must satisfy. It doesn't actually specify what that API is, but it says the API that is being used must meet the requirements specified in the proposal. Um, and APIs would allow the third parties to access that data accurately and securely, and the providers may not charge a fee to retrieve their data. Thank you, Ken. Um, I'm still still going. So, so okay. yeah. uh, in response, so third parties must follow security protocols. And I think this is really one of the key concerns of the industry that um, the consumer has authorized a third party to access the data. 
uh, there has to be tight guardrails to ensure that the consumer's data is not compromised and used improperly. Um, and I've listed here the obligations that the third parties must follow. And who will enforce the rules? So the current federal regulatory scheme generally provides that if you're a depository institution with assets in excess of $10 billion, the CFPB will enforce those rules for those institutions. For institution depository institutions with less than $10 billion in assets, the prudential regulators, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC, and the National Credit Union Administration will administer uh, 1033 for the, those institutions. And attorney generals and state regulators also have enforcement authority. Uh, the comment period ended in December. As I mentioned, the Bureau expects to issue a final rule later this year. So this is an important step uh, in the 1033 process. Um, I, I think I like to do the analogy that um, in the cell phone uh, industry, there was a lot of frustration that if a consumer had a cell phone number that they've used for a very long period of time, and if they wanted to break up with their cell phone provider, for example, they were unhappy with the service, it could be very frustrating because they would lose the number. So the <clears throat> Federal Communication Commission issued a rule uh, requiring cell phone providers to allow consumers to transfer their cell phone number to a new provider. And that's a similar theory here, that if I have have a long-standing banking relationship and I want to break up with my bank because I'm, for example, I'm unhappy with my service, I can take my data with me and bring it to my new financial institution, which can import it into my new account. So there's a seamless transition uh, to the, the degree of the data that's been provided. So that is one of the goals here is it puts pressure on financial institutions, that it's easier for consumers who are unhappy with their services to switch to a new provider by transferring and porting their data. There's also hope for financial inclusion. For example, this will uh, facilitate and encourage greater use of uh, data in a consumer's financial account in, for underwriting loans. So for the credit invisible, uh, for people with thin files, no files, who are outside of the banking system, that the ability to analyze their data to help inform credit decisions could bring, expand financial inclusion to those people who are currently uh, outside of it. So there's a lot of hope and promise in this, but the devil is always in the details. We will see the final rule hopefully later this year, and then the industry will work uh, to implement. So this is an important step and stay tuned. Thank you very much, Ken, and lots of interesting pieces of this regulation, some more controversial than others that I'm sure we're going to want to uh, elaborate on uh, over the next few minutes. Before we move towards talking about potential risk, challenges, or other opportunities of this um, um, data sharing uh, ecosystem. I'd like to hear from Karin about the experience of the European Union in terms of cooperation among mar market participants. It seems clear that designing the right environmental framework is, to say the least, is not easy. So how to get all the parties involved that can be thousands, as, as Jane mentioned. I'm very curious to hear what Karin has to say in terms of the experience of the European Union um, with market cooperation. Thank you, Paulina. So first, um I will take a small moment to explain a bit uh, one specific element of our governance of retail payments in Europe uh, with one body that we have uh, designed, which is the Euro Retail Payments Board, or ERPB in short. And the ERPB is actually a key pillar via which the ECB is exerting its catalyst role. Uh, the ERPB, ERPB sorry, started to work 10 years ago. We actually had the first meeting in May 2014. So this year in June, we had really the 10th anniversary of uh, ERPB working. And uh, by now, it's really recognized as an essential pillar of retail payments governance in Europe. It's chaired at the highest level in the ECB, so by our executive board member in charge of payments. And it brings together um, representatives at high level from the demand and supply side of the retail payments market on an equal basis. So as you said, maybe there are thousands of actors to bring together, but we try also to keep this lean and we have seven from the demand side, seven from the supply side. So this is uh, trying to bring the, the relevant stakeholder associations at the, at the European level. 
And the basis for this is really that uh, we acknowledge that cooperation is key in a market with network effects like uh, the 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 market for for retail payments. So this is why we we have set up this uh, this body and we work a lot with this body uh, on several topics, including open banking. So we have seen that uh, there is a risk of fragmented implementation of open banking across Europe, and this is where we thought it's good to take a catalyst action to bring this topic to the to this fora, the, the Euro Retail Payments uh, Board. So we we have as baseline for this work that we have. Um, a baseline with the, the PSD2, so an important legislative foundation. Uh, but still, uh, there is this idea that open banking models would not work without cooperation between stakeholders. And this is, I guess, also very likely the case for open finance. So if we look at the, the work of the RPB for open banking, the strategy goal from the beginning was to create a setting that would lead to mutually beneficial outcome for both the different parties around the table, meaning here the third party providers and the banks. And this was um, with the idea to go beyond the legislative baseline of PSD2. So to ensure also that marketable payment services could be provided. You may remember what I told this free access uh, of, uh, of data. So uh, the RPB has paved the way by providing a forum for all stakeholders to define the basic elements to which they could agree. This was a long, uh, but eventually successful process. And uh, the work stream now has completed its work in the context of the RPB. And now there is a scheme that has been set recently, which is called the SEPA Payment Account Access Scheme, which is designed by market participants under the auspices now of the European Payments Council, which represents uh, payment services providers in Europe. So this scheme is covering payment services that go beyond those basic services that are required by the legislation. And banks can actually charge third-party providers for using banks' customer data in this scheme. This is a voluntary scheme. Uh, now the working group uh, is working on the go-to-market of the scheme uh, and also onboarding participants to the scheme. For the time being, but the process of adherence to the scheme has been launched rel re relatively recently. We have only third party providers who have joined the scheme. And for the success of the scheme, of course, we need to have a participation of the two sides of the market. So the next steps foresee uh, a launch of two pilots, which uh, we hope will encourage participation of more stakeholders. Now, um, we think that the payment account access scheme, um, which is set to work across Europe, uh, has the potential to um, offer new business activity. It can also support efficient payment methods beyond cards and uh, would also allow merchants and retailers to tap new markets across borders. And finally, um, to mention another important aspect in the context of open banking and also, I guess, open finance, there is uh, one, I, one say point uh, to consider that to strengthen the adoption of open banking and open finance products by customers, more education may be necessary. And actually, there is research on drivers of adoption for open banking that show that usefulness and trust seem key for the adoption of open banking. And this differs from findings on general technology adoption, where we see that it's more usefulness and ease of use, which are the most important drivers. So and I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin. And I think, yeah, what you're saying, it resonates very much with something that we heard from other panelists as well, you No, know, kind of like when you, Jane was sharing how when you have a good product that provides insights to the customers, then they want more and they are willing to share more of their data. The education can be for sure another angle in that sense. So we have a lot of interesting questions coming in the chat that I think are going to follow very naturally in a discussion about risks and challenges and other opportunities of open banking. These questions have to do with privacy, misuse of consumer consumer data, the incentives of large financial institutions to share their data, and potentially differential regulation for banks and fintechs. Well, I want to cover a lot of that shortly. Before we move to that, I just wanted to see among the panelists if you have any follow-ups to this discussion about the landscape that we have heard so far. And if we don't, that's fine, because like they will not... Uh, yes, Jose Luis? Yes, Pauline, I'd like to make a comment, because I think uh, very interesting what Kenneth and Pierre and Karim said uh, regarding how difficult it is to regulate uh, an industry that is changing technologically so fast. 
So, I mean, it, it, one thing that I think we are seeing is that we're facing as regulators new challenges for, and that are going to force us to think about regulation in a different way. Uh, one element of that is the the element of coordination between financial authorities, not just with all the rest of the industry, but just within the financial authority. For us in Mexico, it has been a challenge because the law establishes particular uh, responsibilities depending on the type of information that is to be shared, which uh, regulator is in charge of that. So making a compatible regulation for the APIs to be standardized independently on the type of information that is shared it's been it's been a challenge and and you know it just seems to me that this idea of trying to be very dynamic and trying to come out first and you know do things trying to take advantage of the of the technological change may have its drawbacks in the sense that if you do things too fast you could affect uh consumers right the security of the information etc so it just seems to me that facing a new uh, type of challenge and uh, with the fintech law in Mexico, we had to learn a lot of things that were not considered in the law when we started seeing the new models that were uh, subject to approval from regulation. Thank you, Paulina. Yeah, thanks, Jose Luis. Jane? Yeah, and, and I think following on from that, this is really the first in the US, especially the first big test of the data economy. Right. It is really hard to regulate. And, you know, we haven't talked about ad tech and marketing, and I think there's been some things in the chat here. But this is less around just what is consent and disclosures. And it is much more around what is the business case? Like, how are companies making money from people's data? And I loved the, uh, the research that was shared earlier that showed when people understand what their data is being used for, they actually use less. And I think if you can combine that sort of the, the user behavior around consent and disclosures, as well as a regulatory view of business cases, not just like what data is being shared, but at how it's being monetized, I think that's something that has been missing from a lot of the conversation really is that, that business case. Because a lot of the, the fintechs, again, Amex, always consumer permissioned, we do not sell data, but a lot of the fintech use cases were, that was just a, you know, data flow to hedge funds. And that was, you know, a free a, a free service. And so I think the more we can acknowledge that now as regulatory frameworks are being set, glo set globally, the better. Yes, and I think that speaks uh, very naturally to potential uh, consumer protection initiatives that could help empower consumers to make uh, better decisions. Um, ultimately, it's going to depend as well on the type of products that are offered. Um, I think, Jose Luis, you have some, some thoughts you share with us on kind of like how ultimately it's the characteristics of the demand, or as Karin was saying, the levels of education, of the levels of sophistication or initial access uh, to financial services that can affect ultimately the type of products that we see in the market. Yes, Paulina, I, I think that, uh, I mean, it's an interesting thing that is happening is that you're having a lot of new information generated. You know, the this, uh, you look at the number of people that have smartphones in Mexico, even people of relatively low levels of income have a smartphone and are performing a lot of uh, operations, many of them financial operations. And so... But I, I guess the the uh, part of the problem that we face is that all this information can be used negatively. I mean, it's uh, we're having in Mexico the entrance of of some institutions that are not regulated yet that provide uh, loans to people based on their on their social networks information, and you know, and that me in a way that could be. Uh, uh, against the interest of the of the customers. I mean, there is a very particular case of, of a company that provides uh, loans to people of uh, relatively low income, not based on their credit history, but based on their connections and on their social networks. And what they do is that if you don't pay, 
they start writing to all your connections that you don't pay your loans. Or they start offering to your connection. So you know what I mean? The, the sharing that kind of information has to be done as, as we all have been mentioning here with the consent, not only with the consent of the, of the customer, but also with very clear goals of what the business case is. I mean, it seems to me that the effort, the technological effort that we are being, we're discussing now has to be accompanied by a parallel effort on financial education. Uh, you have a lot of people that don't really know how to protect their data. They don't know how their the information that they're they're you know saying yes, I agree to share this information, but they don't really know how it is going to be used. Who's going to have it? You know, if the, if the permission have to be uh, renewed. So it, you know, it just seems to me that again, there we the regulators have new challenges that we're going to have to to try to face the best way we can. Thanks, Alina. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I know we're coming uh, to the end of the time that we were originally assigned, but we got Jose's approval to go a little bit over time and eat up into the lunch break. So uh, I want to hear from Guilherme and then from Ken and from Fredes. And, Guilherme? Uh, and I think I think Karine might have to leave. If, if she has to leave, yeah. that's okay. Exactly. So sorry for that. And uh, thanks for the good discussion. Wishing you a good continuation of the panel and the conference. Thank Bye. you, <laughs> Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Guilherme? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. So, so just a follow on about this topic, uh, uh, about education and uh, awareness of open banking or open finance. Although here in Brazil, we have uh, impressive numbers, positive numbers, we have a lot to do because we have statistics and studies that show that the majority of the population here in Brazil haven't heard about open finance and don't know what that could bring of benefits or, or even uh, the, 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 the most people uh, is afraid to share their data, even uh, about uh, fraud or misuse. So we have a lot of challenges and as regulators, we and the private market we have uh, a lot of actions to do and improve and and uh the security it's uh, it's very it's very good but we ne we have to show to the people that uh, open finance can bring a lot of benefits to them so that's it yes thank you Guilherme. uh ken and then fredes so um, someone in the chat asked about the fair lending concerns about open banking, and this is a great, uh, important issue. As I mentioned, we're going to see a greater use of your data, your bank account data, and potentially your credit card data to help underwrite loans. And while that may expand financial inclusion by allowing people who are outside, don't have a credit history to obtain credit based on, on having a good transaction history, it raises fair lending concerns. Um, if the data is a proxy for a prohibited basis, such as race, religion, national origin, then a lender could be making a credit decision on a prohibited basis. Um, for example, the rule says, the proposal says that uh, the name of the payee or merchant can be included in the transaction information. So suppose I'm a lender and I obtain someone's credit card history and I see the merchants. I mean, it raises a number of thorny issues about privacy and, and, and for, for lending, um, is that information being used on a prohibited basis? Um, the agencies have previously issued a statement on the use of alternative data and, and um, a favorable uh, an indication about the use of transaction account data, such as a checking account, because um, it tends to be neutral and, and it tends um, to, to have less fair lending risk. But it would be important for any lender who is relying on open banking data from a credit card issuer or a uh, financial institution account to have guardrails, testing, and protocols in place to ensure that they are not making lending decisions from that data uh, on a 
prohibited basis. The other important consumer issue I mentioned is the liability. Um, there probably be, will be increased risk of unauthorized and fraudulent transactions. The Bureau has said that Regulation E and the Electronic Fund Transfer Act apply, which generally limits a consumer's liability to $50 if the unauthorized transaction is promptly reported. The industry has expressed concern about who among the various players would absorb that loss. Is it the authorized party? Is it the financial institution? So that that is a big concern about sorting out. Um, we know that the consumer generally wouldn't be liable for that loss, but you have other parties involved in it. Who's going to assume it? There are network rules in the ACH. There will probably be the agreements among the participants that will uh, address the issue of who who is responsible for unauthorized transactions. But these are important issues that need to be sorted out um, as this rule gets uh, implemented. One final thing is if you're a data aggregator, I mentioned that if you're collecting data from financial institutions on behalf of authorized third parties, uh, the proposal says that you would be subject to the Fair Credit Reporting Act as a consumer reporting agency. So anyone who was thinking about being a data aggregator in this new scheme would be have that compliance burden of the Fair Credit Reporting Act to ensure that if there is a dispute about the information being used, that the consumer would have rights under uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I know we're short of time, so I will send it back to you, Pauline. Thank you, Ken and Fredes. Yeah, thank you very much. No, I would. I wanted to follow up on on this uh, consumer protection uh, safeguard. Uh, I know that many countries are looking a lot at the increased transparency of the, the service providers, these TPPs, and also data aggregators. And also another measure that is becoming very common is the creation of these uh, trusted entities uh, by certification, uh, either certification authorities or certification schemes, where uh, you include these TPPs in kind of a registry so that consumers and the market participants are able to see who are these TPPs. And if they are in the list, they are considered trusted. If they are not in the list, they are considered that they are not trusted. So, so that helps consumers uh, also to navigate these uh, uncertain waters. Um, I'll there. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Fredes. And uh, just before we close the, the panel, uh, there was a question about um, whether large financial institutions may not have an incentive to share the data. I think it was very interesting from Guilherme's presentation how in Brazil the regulation ensured that large financial institutions had to share the data, which is a project taken in some countries, that builds into the differential regulation. Large financial institutions have a different burden relative to smaller financial institutions or fintech companies. And um, I just want to close the panel uh, hearing some thoughts um, on uh, privacy, that it's a topic that has been present and will be present across the conference, even in the afternoon. We'll have some very interesting sessions on how the latest developments in machine learning to incorporate privacy considerations and societal preferences for privacy. So I just wanted to hear conceptually, maybe just from the panel, I guess uh, maybe Jane, if you can just tell us a little bit from, um, and we'll conclude with that, how you uh, see the privacy concerns, identity theft, fraud, uh, from uh, the perspective of an industry participant and not only regulators, yes. Yeah, I think being permission first, privacy first, security first, like is the cost of doing business now. And but unfortunately, you have whether they're state actors or fraudsters, like you have some amazing innovation happening in the fraud space. So as an industry, it is like even more important to be doing sharing best practices, sharing learnings, having real time alerts. You know, when you've got things like early warning system in the U.S., it's traditionally for banks, how do you extend that out for fintechs as well? Like, there is a lot of work to do, and right now it is a combination of, like, technology, and, like, the technology moving away from credentials to tokens helps a lot, right? Already just baked within that, you know, and baking within those tokens what can actually be shared because there's a lot of de-identified data. So there is a lot of baked in privacy um, initiatives happening with the technology itself. I think we've trained in the US especially 
there is now erring on the side of don't click on anything, right? Everything is a scam. Don't click on anything where now it comes to things like reauthorization, reauthorizing access. Will people think that that's a scam and not click on it? Then their token doesn't get refreshed. They miss a payment. They go into overdraft. Like there's a lot of unintended consequences that happen off the basis of privacy. But I think this is a much to my earlier point about this is the biggest test of the data economy. This is much bigger than financial services. Data exhaust is being thrown off in every single industry. Financial services happens to be the first one to actually tackle it in a real way. But, you know, it is an arms race, you know, with AI, with, you know, what are the data sources for AI is a massive privacy challenge as well, because it's not just the banks and fintechs where the data are. The data, it's, you know, it's in ad tech companies, it's in marketers, it's in companies itself. So there is a lot of work to do. And I think the more that people understand that their data exhaust is working against them and they need to take steps as well to protect their own privacy, I think the better we're going to be. I agree. No, and I think that's a great one. Of your last few lines is a great line to close the panel. This is much bigger than just financial services. I think we're going to see a lot of these data sharing impacting all industries. And um, so I want to thank all the panelists uh, for their very insightful comments and presentations from these very uh, diverse perspectives. And uh, with that, uh, we'll send it back to you, Raluca, Jose. Uh, thank you for giving us this extra 10 minutes because we could have continued talking about it forever uh, is a very interesting topic for sure.